It is hour two of Overdrive here on TSN 4, live on TSN 1050. Aaron Karolnik in for Brian Hayes with my friends Frank Corrado and Jamie Noodles McLennan. We'll talk to Chris Johnson, our hockey insider, in about five minutes. Keegan Matheson, live from Dunedin at 5.30. Get the lowdown on Joey Votto, who inked a minor oh. league deal with the Toronto Blue Jays. Very exciting. Maybe a little bit nostalgic. Not really sure what Joey Votto's got left, but it's a minor league deal. Very low cost, zero cost, really. And yeah. they'll, they'll take a peek at, at Votto and see if he's got anything left. And if he doesn't, he won't be on the team. That's okay. See if he's got something. And like with the way things went for the Jays in the offseason, this is the biggest splash they made is bringing in Joey Votto on a, on a minor league deal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Him and, him and, him and man. Justin Turner. I mean, really, yeah. like it just, it, it I don't know from Blue Jays fans. I got a buddy who's a big Blue Jays fan, and he just always – he'll write, like, one word. And I'm like, Blue Jays offseason, question mark, just goes underwhelming. Mm -hmm. And I was like, all right, fair enough. Like, But aren't they kind of laying it all on the young players going, like, we're giving you a pathway here. This is all your – it's kind of like the Leafs trade deadline. You know, it's around the edges, and, and Tree comes out and says, yeah, we just, you know – we, we want to give a pathway here for our top players to be top players. Isn't that the mantra with the Blue Jays, too? In some respects, you can make the argument that it is. I guess the difference would be the salary cap. There's no hard salary cap in baseball, so the Jays could spend as much as they wanted, and there's still some guys who are out there, like Blake Snell, a Cy Young winner, J.D. Martinez, a guy who's had some really big seasons amongst the many other guys. So we'll, we'll get to Keegan Matheson's take on that when he joins us uh, just after 5.30. We should also acknowledge that today is the four-year anniversary of the Rudy Gobert night, which we all remember where we were when the coronavirus officially became a thing. And that was when the NBA shut down its season. Donald Trump goes on TV and says you can't, uh, Europeans can't travel to the United States. It was the next day that the NHL shut down their season. Yeah. And it's incredible that it's been four years, which seems like it was so long ago, but simultaneously so recent, if that makes any sense. Crazy. But, I mean, it, that was four years ago tonight that that happened. You guys I were never, the last game, right, Noodles? Yeah. You guys the was, very last game. Last game in the National Hockey League, and Gobert touched all the, you <laughs> oh, know, man. touched all the microphones and all of that. But we were in L.A. I had a buddy down visiting, and Sam Cicerello, our producer, gets into my ear. And it was weird. We had an eerie feeling before the game because the building was only about half full. And like COVID was kind of coming out and people were, and I remember Sam say, saying to me, Rudy Gobert just tested positive. I guarantee you this is the last NHL game. And we called the game. I ended up going for a beer with my buddy. We went to a comedy show that night and it was even weird. Like I, at that point, I, I can't remember, like I had read like it was coming and I was like washing my hands a ton and being like a weirdo about all everything. And even that night, like everything was kind of half full. Everyone was kind of half in. And sure enough, the next day I flew home, I landed, I did the show with Mark Rowe. And within two days, I was set up at home and we did like two years straight at home. Like Overdrive did 750 shows or something straight at home, whatever it was. But that was, yeah, March 11th. It's insane. Like, that was four years ago. Yeah. Wow. I was still, I was playing Noodles, and I was playing for <laughs> Ottawa's farm team at the time. Like, I was playing with Norris, Batherson, Parker Kelly, Brandstrom, uh, Philip Gustafson was our goalie, Joey Decord was our other goalie, and we were a really good, like, we were, Our first, yeah. we were a first place team that year in, in the Eastern Conference. And wow. we were playing a game in Laval that night, and we had to go to upstate New York after that game. We were supposed to go straight to Utica, which is not like a cupcake of a bus trip in that no. league. So right after the game, our coach comes in. He's like, we're going to go back to Belleville because we don't know what's going to happen. Like the, the NBA guy just tested positive, and um, if we do end up playing that game tomorrow, we'll just go day of the game, which also sucks Like to, to get to, to upstate New York from Belleville. So we go back and everyone on the bus kind of feels like we know we're not going to we're not going to go back. We're not going to play. Anyways, we get there. Sure enough, find out the next morning leagues shut down and we never came back and played like we were, you know, the NHL came back. They did the bu the bubble, the AHL shut it down. And it was such a waste of a year because 
We were the first place team. All those young guys, Jamie, that you you know you know those guys well. You see them. That would have been really um, uh, that, that would have been really cool for them to experience a playoff run in the yeah. AHL and just play in, in that winning kind of environment, that urgent environment where you need to win games and it's crunch time. And, and those guys lost out on a, on a lot of valuable time in, in hockey, and, and that was it. Yeah, development. Like, yeah, you, you think about it though. Even the Shane Wright draft. Like Slapkowski, like those guys missed a lot of hockey and critical development time. So that's uh, it's, it's really interesting to to look at, you know, looking back. But it's four years today, man. Oh man, we all remember where we were that day. I know. I still remember Trump's like State of the Union that night. And I'm watching. And I'm like, where are we going as a <laughs> world in which the borders are shut down? Who knows? But uh, it's crazy that it was indeed four years ago. Tonight, uh, let's welcome in TSN Hockey Insider Chris Johnson, who's joining us now on the Maple Toyota Hotline. What's up, CJ? I'm doing well, guys. How are you? We're good. There's some rumors around TSN that you're currently in an exotic destination. Can you confirm those? I can confirm that. Mm. Uh, you couldn't believe if, if you could have my view right now. I'm <laughs> basically ocean, ocean side with palm trees. So oh, wow. Um, I love it. That does sound very nice. That's very the generous. way to do it, hey? Yeah. Like like grind right up until trade deadline and then take off for a bit. That's it makes it worth it. Makes the grind worth it. Well, Chris Johnson knows what he's doing. Yeah. So CJ, just heading back to Friday and the Toronto Maple Leafs in particular, and some of Brad Tree Living's yeah. post deadline availabilities, he did reference some bigger deals that were contemplated. Any idea exactly some of the things that Tree Living was trying to do? Was it try to acquire a center? Maybe there were other defensemen that may have been in the mix. Any buzz you've heard on that front? No, my sense is, if anything, it was more about trying to get some defense in with term uh, under, under you know, back in the, you know, in, in the least wings there. And, and I just don't think that that was there. I mean, ultimately, this was a strange deadline. I mean, we, we know what Vegas did, but you know, there weren't really a lot of high quality, high impact players that traded teams that there, there wasn't a lot on the marketplace. And I think the Leafs explored to see, you know, what else might be out there if they were going to think about trading their first round pick or, you know, one of their top prospects like Fraser Minton or Easton Cowan. And, and, you know, ultimately we know where they landed. They, they went, you know, sort of bargain bin shopping, I would call it, you know, which is what a lot of the deadline typically is. It's, it's you know, third or fourth line forwards, third pairing defensemen. I mean, that's, that's kind of the order of the day. And then of course there's a couple uh, you know, exceptions to that, like a Jake Gensel or some of the other players that would move Sean Monahan, you know, a month ahead of the deadline. And so, you know, I think that that's kind of what he was referencing is they looked at ways that they could have maybe used some of that capital that ended up, ended up touching that could have maybe changed, you know, how things look, not just for the rest of this season and the playoffs, but, you know, heading into future years and ultimately nothing made sense. And so, you know, I, I, I personally really understand what the least of the deadline. I think that they were, not loaded for bear to, to, to really bid on the top uh, rental players like a Chris Tanev, who we know they, they would love to have had, you know, all things being equal. And instead they, they went for some, you know, marginal upgrades around the roster, hoping for a better penalty kill after acquiring the two defensemen and the forward they did. And, you know, onwards we go towards the playoffs. CJ, what do you make of uh, Mitch Marner's uh, little tweak or injury or lower? Like, are you, is there concern out of Leafland or is it more just precautionary? It doesn't seem like huge concern right now, Noodles. I think that, you know, it comes at a good, I mean, there's no good time to have one of your top players out of the lineup, but certainly where the Leafs are at, this is a good time for it to, to come about because I think they can afford to be careful. There's no reason to rush them. Uh, obviously, they won the game on Saturday without them in the lineup and, and can, you know, kind of kind of a light schedule too, not playing again until Thursday now. Um, so you know, it doesn't, doesn't seem like anything that's too alarming yet, and, you know, it underlines one thing about Mitch Marner. I mean, the, the guy has barely missed any time uh, in eight years as an NHL player. He had a broken collarbone early in his career. Uh, he's missed a couple games since then, but really has been, uh, uh, you know, for the, the concerns about his size, I would say, entering the league and, and how he would, you know, stand up to, to going up against men as being one of the, the smaller players. I mean, he's it hasn't hurt him at all. He's played massive minutes and, and very rarely missed time, and, I don't get any sense that there's anything uh, too alarming about this absence now. And if, in fact, I think the Leafs are in a good spot where they can, you know, allow them to, to take the time he needs to rest up because we all know uh, while they're trying to win all these games, finish as high as they can in the standings, that 
you know, it's, it's now already uh, the focus is on where they're going to be in mid-April and, and when those playoffs start. CJ, you talked about the mindset the Leafs had leading up to the trade deadline with the moves that they made. What do you read into that? Do you read into, into that that it's management saying to the, the big boys on the team, Matthews, Marner, Nylander, like, you guys got the keys, you guys got to do it, there's no one coming to help you, or is it like we don't really believe this is necessarily the group that's going to get through Boston and Florida, so we're going to hold back a little bit and not, um, you know, not push our chips all in? I read the first part of your, your question there, Frankie. I think it's more, I don't sense any lack of belief from management. I just think it was this, this deadline where, you know, to, to spend some significant assets, you know, you weren't, there weren't just the players available to make a bigger deal. I, I don't think that it was a lack of belief or anything like that. I mean, if, if there was a lack of belief, you probably don't trade out five or six draft picks as they did in, in the series of deals they made, even if they were lower sort of mid, mid to late round draft picks. I mean, I, I think that there's there's a lot of belief in the team. Um, you know, we can look at their record versus the whole league right now, but you can also look at what's happened since, you know, say uh, the start of the new year or, you know, back into December. I mean, the Leafs are one of the best teams in terms of a lot of the metrics you might look at, you know, be they underlying or just, you know, wins and points in the bank. And, you know, well, I don't think any of us know what to make of this team at this point. The core has been the same for so many years and, and, you know, obviously they, they've only won the one playoff round as a team, you know, they, they have won a lot of games here in, in the last couple of months. And, and I think that, you know, defensively they've made a lot of improvements. I'm not talking about with the, the trades they made, but, but even in the last, you know, six to eight weeks that this team as a whole has, has tightened up, you're getting better goal setting out Ilya Samsonov. And, and so, you know, no one's sitting here, I don't think calling the Leafs the favorite to win the cup, but certainly they're one, among the better teams in the league. And, I think management believed in them. It's just, you know, there wasn't a lot out there that made sense for a team with as, as few assets at the high end as the Leafs had. And so, you know, let's see where it goes. I think if you're going to commit half your, your salary cap to four forwards, I mean, ultimately you need those four forwards to be big-time difference makers in, in whatever happens at the most important time of year. And so, you know, that's probably always been the case, but I think it's especially the case heading into this April, May. And, um you know, it's, it's not been a perfect year, but sometimes that, that works in your favor as a team because it forces you to work through some things, and I think we've seen the best version of the Leafs in the last few weeks uh, you know, compared to the you know, October, November, December time. Chris Johnson, TSN Hockey Insider, our guest here on Overdrive. You mentioned Ilya Samsonov, who is now 12-2 since being recalled from the AHL. Joseph Wall's back, healthy and performing well. I mean, I don't think anybody saw this coming, let's say two months ago, that really the thing that the Leafs could rely on the most and have the least concerns about was their goaltending. But that's the situation we currently find ourselves in. If you had to handicap the likelihood of Samsonov or Wall starting game one of the Stanley Cup playoffs for the Leafs, who do you think has the upper hand right now? I mean, I might be a prisoner at the moment, but I'm going to go Samsonov. I mean, for a month now, you've seen him have a lot of success. Uh, you know, if you had asked me the same question in late December, early January, <laughs> probably would have been a little bit different for obvious reasons. But, you know, I'm just not so, you know, Joseph Wall, I think, is going to have a tremendous NHL career. I have no doubts about him big picture as, as a goaltender that's going to make an impact in the league. But, you know, he still doesn't have a ton of experience. You know, he had a significant injury and a significant layoff. And I just don't know if he's going to be able to get enough playing time between now and the start of the playoffs. Um, and obviously part of this will be, I mean, Samsonov's in pole position right now. I mean, he has to, he has to show the least something where they have doubted about him again before now in the start of the playoffs. I mean, I, I think, I think you, you, you go into the playoffs most likely as I sit here on March 11th, looking at it, that, that, that he will be the guy to start, uh, but you, you can change. And, and, you know, lots of teams, including the Vegas gold Knights as recently as last spring have success with making a change in the playoffs when I mean, you can go back. Many, many years ago when the Hurricanes won a cup, you know, started with one goalie, went to another. And, and there have been other examples of that. We, you know, even Pittsburgh, you know, started with Flurry a couple times and had Matt Murray come in and, and win them those cups, ultimately the biggest games in 16 and 17. Um, you know, you don't have to, you don't, you don't commit for 25 games, you know, but by who you start on the first game of the playoffs. But I, I do think it's, it's really trending strongly towards Samsonov uh, having earned that role, you know, more experienced goaltender and, Again, I mean, maybe in a, in a strange roundabout way, you've never wanted him to go through the struggles he went through and obviously had some pretty big lows this season, but uh, he's been steady uh, the last month or so in, in the Leafs' crease. He's not had very many off nights and 
they've won a lot of games with him in there, and I, I think he'll ultimately be playing game one of the, of the playoffs, and then we go from there and see what happens. CJ, a little bit of a bizarre scene, if you want to call it that, with John Tortorella down in Tampa. I don't know if he really was refusing to leave. Like, I would imagine at some point he was going to leave. I think he just wanted to say his piece. But, you know, what do you make of the ejection? And I think that's the fourth ejection uh, of the year this year. I think we had three last year. Just what do you make of the whole torts situation? Yeah, I think we haven't heard the last of this just generally. I mean, obviously, Torts, he's coached from the league a long time. He's, he's been fined a number of times for comments he's made. You know, I think they've come down on him a little harder than some of the other coaches in terms of giving him a two-game suspension and a 50 grand fine um, because of his, his history, you know, versus what exactly happened in that game in Tampa. But, you know, I, I do think that this is going to be a, an interesting talking point. And when I call it interesting, the average fan probably isn't going to care, but it's it's certainly – something that has a lot of people behind the scenes chatting because, you know, basically the coaches were called into a meeting in Chicago in September at where the GMs were meeting for, for the first time in a long time. All the coaches came to that meeting. Gary Bettman kind of, you know, showed a video and read them a riot act in terms of saying we don't want coaches, you know, looking the way they do, arguing with referees, you know, swearing on TV where you can sort of read lips. You know, obviously networks like ours show, show those shots when, there's a hot moment between a coach, you know, noodles is between the bench for a lot of those games. He probably hears a lot of what goes on. But, you know, the league's trying to clamp down on that, but the flip side is, is, is where's the referee accountability, right? And I'm not taking a side in this. It's just more, you know, the referees have a lot of saying what happens. The referee has the, the single distinction to throw someone out of the game. Uh, and, you know, I, I would say kind of what we've seen generally like even when Sheldon Keith got thrown out of the game recently and he got a $25,000 fine, like it didn't look that bad in terms of what the cameras caught. I mean, of course, maybe they missed something, but you know, I actually think that we've seen coaches fall a little bit more in line since that talk they had in September, but you're still seeing them thrown out with a little bit more regularity. And obviously there's a fine that comes with that. And, you know, I don't, I don't know if there's any recourse to challenge those things or, or appeal those fines or, or suspensions, but you know, I, I still think there's a lot, there's a high degree of, um, What's the best way to put it? I think doubt about where where things are at with the refereeing standard in the league. You know, no one's really arguing that, that those coaches didn't have a reason to be checked off in the moment. I mean, usually it, it is missed calls or a series of, of poorly officiated games. And so I don't know where it goes next. I agree. It's a, it's a strange situation You know that the Flyers did step up and say they're going to pay the fine for Tortorella. But, um, you know, I, I just I just feel that, that the that – the sort of next level clamp down here is going to lead to a pushback uh, to some degree from the coaches. You don't have a lot of, I mean, you don't have a lot of levers to pull in these discussions. I mean, I think a coach is in a weird spot. I mean, his, his manager's watching the same game up in the press box and, and expects him to be arguing bad calls. His players are, are sitting in front of him, expect him to be defending the team's honor. And then when he does so, he gets nailed by the league. So I, I think it's kind of a no win situation for coaches. And, you know, I'm curious to see, uh, you know, what, what the fallout is because, you know, I, I, I don't think that, that these guys are going to be too happy with all these fines and, and everything we've seen this year, which is clearly on the uptick from, from prior seasons. CJ, speaking of follow, what do you make of Pitts, Pittsburgh's situation? You know, we were talking about it earlier. You know, Sidney Crosby, I mean, Pittsburgh loses again uh, to Edmonton yesterday. They're having a tough time finding the back of the net. Sid is visibly showing some frustration where he, you know, at the end of the game yesterday, he had Kulak in a headlock and, you know, Bunting's in there doing his thing, jumping on people's backs and, you know, all of that type of stuff. But, it, I mean, at the end of the day, where do you see Pittsburgh going? Because it looks like they've got a mountain to, to climb here. You know, is it, if it's a retool situation, does Sid... Is he a part of that? Like we were trying to figure out. Do you think him, Dubis, you know, Sullivan, who's part of the the, almost feels like he's part of the management group, even though at some point they might have to have a coaching change. You know, what do you make of the whole kind of situation in Pittsburgh and how they move forward with that? To me, what makes them so compelling is none of us know what's going to happen there. I mean, absolutely none of us. You, right. You've barely ever seen a team like them, right? I mean, it's seventeen years where they were in it every year. And obviously they had some ups and downs internally, but they, they were a team that made the playoffs for a long stretch that always, they always acted like a team that had a chance to win. They were always at the deadline making trades and, and, you know, getting a Jerome again, left, for example, which didn't work out in that specific circumstance. But in that moment, you can't deny as an organization, they were doing everything they could do to, to win in those seasons. And, and, you know, some of it went well and some of it didn't. And they hung three banners in their building 
uh, and lost in a four Stanley Cup final, and they've they've been in the mix for as long as any of us can basically remember. And all of a sudden now, uh, they, they're they're not there, and it, and it's clear, you know, based on what they did at the deadline, and for the first time in Sidney Crosby's career, Denny Malkin's career, Chris Letang's career, these guys are faced with wondering the same things that, that we're wondering, and and so I don't have the answer for what happens next, but I think it it is going to be pretty darn compelling, and I think it's. It's a very going to be very topical because it's hard for any of us to sit here, I think, and argue that, that, that there's any set of moves that could be made between now and next, you know, September, October, that, that reasonably we could be sitting here and going, okay, well, the Penguins now are for real. You know, they, they made their moves last offseason, right? It's not just that the guys they've had that have been legacy players. I mean, they, they traded a first-round pick plus, plus, plus for $10 million of Eric Carlson's contract, and it hasn't worked. And, and the, the fallout from that is that you've still got Eric Carlson on the roster, uh, still taking up, you know, an eighth of the roster, give or take, uh, and and it's probably much harder to move. And if you're moving them, you're attaching assets to them. Uh, obviously, the other players are getting one year older, and Crosby's had an amazing age 36 season this year. You know, I don't know where they go. And I, I, and honestly, my feeling right now, and just this, like talking to people there, I get the sense that they don't know where they go next, and that's you know that's where it gets interesting. And so, there, I I can comfortably say that to this point, Sidney Crosby's career is never truly thought in a meaningful way about playing somewhere else. Um, you know, he might have to have that thought. I, I don't think it's going to happen on March 11th or 12th, but you know, when the season's over, when they miss the playoffs by 10 or 12 or 15 points, when it's the second year of the playoffs, when he's, you know, entering the final year of his contract and he has to decide, is he extending in Pittsburgh on July 1st? Uh, when he talks to those that he trusts most, his family, his friends, his, his agents, I mean, I think he's going to at least have to imagine a world outside of Pittsburgh. It doesn't mean he, he acts on it or anything happens. Maybe he decides to go down with the ship and say, I'm, you know, I've been a penguin for literally half his life. He's, he's been a member of that organization at this point in time. And obviously been the, the, the integral part of their success there. But I, I just, it's hard for me to imagine. And, and I like to, I like to account for surprises in life because not everything goes to plan, but I, I just don't see how they're going to get back into a position in the short term where we think that they could be a, a regular playoff team where they could challenge for Stanley Cup. And so that does leave questions for the key members of the organization. And, you know, they start with number 87 for me because there's not a team in the league that, that's trying to win a Stanley Cup that wouldn't want to add him to their roster if that was a possibility. So, you know, I think that they're still processing everything would, would be my, my short answer on the Penguins right now. But, you know, they, they're going to have a fascinating offseason, even, even if they stay put, right? Like if Crosby signs an extension and no one moves on and they – sort of make what I would call regular decisions around the, the, the fringes of the roster. I mean, that in itself is a massive decision from a lot of people. And so we're going to have to, to watch with bated breath. I don't think the last six weeks are going to matter in terms of their games, but, but the six to eight weeks after that are going to be really important. Yeah, it's so fascinating in Pittsburgh what Tampa and Stamkos come to with regards to their respective futures. Are they able to agree on something? Mitch Marner's got a contract. He's eligible to sign on July 1st, the draft going to be quite the off season now with the trade deadline in the rear view you'll be all over it for us cj once you return yeah. from your tropical destination and only <laughs> then all right thank you for doing this <laughs> well, man we got, appreciate it look you got jacob markstrom you've got linus allmark you've got jacob chikrin all kinds of players that, that didn't get traded on friday that that were in the mix too is you know i think the cap going up we're gonna have a, we're gonna have some fireworks this off season that much i'm confident of i love it thank you chris Okay, guys. Take care. That is Chris Johnson, who joined us on the Maple Toyota Hotline. Build your next dream Toyota at Maple Toyota. And check out Maple (laughs) Toyota's pre-owned inventory arriving daily. It's time to Toyota noodles. Visit mapletoyota.com. I was waiting for you to like for him to be like, yes, I'm in Jersey at the airport. <laughs> like I like, he's like, yeah, I'm looking out the windows. Pop. Like I was waiting for him to be like, yes, I'm traveling and and I'm stuck in, you know, some some godforsaken place or whatever. And obviously he's in a nice spot, which good, he's earned that. But I I was waiting for like the punchline where he's like, I'm yeah, I'm in a hotel room that doesn't have a window and I'm sitting, <laughs> you know. Sitting here, that type yeah. of stuff. Well, he was he was serious. He was posting some Instagram stories. There's oh, a yeah? lot of palm trees oh, okay. and oceans and sand. So yeah. CJ knows exactly what he's doing. He's got a, 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 a text that kind of worries me a little bit. Really? From Al's brother. Oh, okay. Apparently he's going on another cruise. 
Did oh, he just? God. Did he not just he go just, on a cruise? This guy <laughs> spends more time on cruises than he does on land. Like he, yeah. he just because I guess he heard us talking to CJ, and CJ's in a tropical destination. And he's like, "Yeah, I'll be looking at palm trees very soon. I'm going on another cruise." He lives quite the life that house. Wow. Good he for has him. Guy. a copious yeah, number of he Hawaiian shirts. must be sponsored shirts. by like a cruise ship. <laughs> a or carnival something. cruise ship. Yeah. <laughs> Royal <Carnival> Caribbean. <laughs> His Al's brother's direct sponsor. Oh, I think he would deserve such an accomplishment. Uh, we have Keegan Matheson coming up. We'll talk to Chris Rose from the NFL Network. A wild day with NFL free agency, which actually is yet to officially arrive Wednesday at 4 p.m. Players can officially sign, but a ton of news trickling out with regards to the National Football League so far today with the tampering period, the official tampering period. I believe that's what they call it, starting today at noon Eastern. Uh, we'll get to that with Chris Rose again in just over half an hour. Keegan Matheson from MLB.com on Joey Votto and the Jays, plus the latest on Manoa, Gosman, and Vlad Jr. That's coming up next. Overdrive is brought to you by FanDuel, bringing you everything from the opening line to the final score. Aaron Karolnik in for Brian Hayes with Frank Corrado and Jamie Noodles McLennan. The Raps and the Nuggets in action tonight. The Raptors are 15 and a half point underdogs. What's your gut tell in you? In Denver. Take Denver. <laughs> 15 and a half points. Like, I wonder when the last time the Raptors. Or that big underdogs in a game. It must be more than a decade. What easily. was the one they they were just nine point dogs and then they ended up losing by forty plus? Yeah, right? was that that's, that's, that's outrageous. Right. That was a tough night, and I think tonight will probably be a difficult challenge as well. No Scotty Barnes, no Jakob Pertl. Frankly, no chance. But you should uh, still listen to the game tonight on TSN 1050. <laughs> Definitely never listen. Say, Definitely don't listen. Say no chance. And then, oh, but tune in because <laughs> yeah. it, can't wait. Like, yeah. yeah can't Jim wait. Taddy will be on yes. the pregame show. Oh, like it'll that. be a spectacular oh, broadcast. Lots to Guns. look forward to tonight, 9 p.m. tip. And the same applies down in Dunedin with the Jays because Joey Votto's there, and there's not really much more than of a gregarious character. I mean, a good Canadian boy, someone who's won the National League MVP. Now, it was a long time ago, but. Maybe Votto's got a little bit of juice left. Let's head down to Dunedin now and visit with MLB.com's Blue Jays reporter, good friend of the program. It's Keegan Matheson back on Overdrive. What's up, man? Doing well down here, guys. How's everything? Excellent. Thank you. Joey Votto, have you to become acquainted in his brief stint with the Blue Jays yet? Yeah. Yesterday he held his uh, kind of opening meeting with us and Guys, let's be very honest and very selfish. What am I, day 30 of spring training? I've written 50 stories. The, the good ones are probably done by now. <laughs> I will, uh, I'll take a fresh narrative. Why not? This is good. And Votto, as people already know, but I, I think he showed again yesterday, is one of the most thoughtful and interesting and definitely most unique uh, players in Major League Baseball. We're standing there in front of a guy who might just be a Hall of Famer and who is one of the greatest players in the history of this country, saying that he's trying out for a team and even any notion that he would expect a spot on the big league roster, he is slapping that away. It's as unique a conversation as I've been a part of in a lot of years. It's one hell of a story. Is it going to work? Uh, we know the realities of guys trying to hang on, but if it works, my God, it's one hell of a story. And if anyone can pull it off, why not Votto? You know, he is a guy who understands this game as well as just about any player in this generation. And he's getting one more shot, one more shot down here. Uh, Keegan, does Votto's veteran presence benefit the young and I guess we'll call it sometimes immature Jays roster? If he does make the team, do you think that, you know, him being a grizzled vet could help some of those young guys get to the next level? It could a little bit, guys. Uh, I, I think the Blue Jays are, I, I hope the Blue Jays should be past the point where they need a guy to come in. I don't think it's a need from Votto, but it's something kind of complimentary. You know, they, they have enough in that room, I think, with someone like Bo Bichette, uh, who I think has grown into the face of this team, number one, but also one of the voices uh, of this team. Votto is someone who can kind of round that out. And a lot of the time, that's how to deal with failure, working with young guys, but also how to deal with success. You know, Joey Votto has had the world revolve around him before. He knows how it feels to own a city, to have people worship you. And 
dealing with success in pro ball can be difficult sometimes in its own ways. So no matter what players on this roster are experiencing, Joey Votto's gone through it before. Nothing is new to him. So between him, Justin Turner's 39, he's been around almost as long. There's nothing that should be new to this clubhouse. I, th- I think they need to take their leadership, their day-to-day rah-rah stuff from the guys they already had. But if Votto can be that extra 1%, why not? He knows as much about this game as anyone right now. Are you seeing anything down there from Alejandro Kirk that would lead you to believe that he can find his form from two seasons ago? <sighs> nothing stands out in a jarring way, guys, but just the fact that he's been here. I think if there is one thing that I appreciate more and more every year doing this job is that if you are late starting spring training or if you lose time in spring training, you're toast. You're done. You're not going to catch up through the year. We see it over and over again, often with pitchers, but with hitters as well. And Alejandro Kirk late coming into camp last year for the birth of his child, which is a very good reason. But we see it on the baseball field eventually. It's hard to catch up and make up those weeks. And once pitchers get ahead of you, you're playing catch-up all season long against the best pitchers on the planet. It's, it's very hard to do. So Kirk has not come in and done anything that makes my eyes pop out of my head. Uh, I wasn't really expecting anything like that. But I think just the fact that he's here, the fact that he is in camp, he does look a little bit better physically, I think, a little bit. But getting a normal spring, I think normal is key for him because Danny Jansen, I I still think, is the 1A. I really like Jansen as a player, and I really like him this year. But having Kirk as that kind of 1B and a guy who you can DH or take off the bench late in games, really important, that can be such a weapon. Wasn't last year. He was a big part of why this offense wasn't as good as it could have been. But just getting back to normal, there's a lot of value in that, and I I think I appreciate that more every single year, seeing how guys deal with this. Keegan Matheson is our guest. He covers the Toronto Blue Jays for MLB.com. Keegan, we know that Alec Manoa and Kevin Gosman were dealing with some some shoulder issues early in spring training. It sounds like they have been doing a lot more. What can you tell us about their current statuses? Yeah, Gosman doesn't sound as worrying, guys. I'd expect to see him facing hitters here in the next few days. Uh, whether that's at the complex or in a game, it's, it's all the same at this point. You just want him facing hitters. And if he can get up to 65, 70 pitches by the end of spring, that's good enough. Maybe your first start of the season is only 85, but that's okay. You go from there, you have a fresh bullpen. Manoa worries me more at this point. Now, we've seen him around the complex. He was doing fielding drills and stuff today. He's playing catch. But you need to be able to do more than that. At this point, it's very obvious he's not going to be ready for the start of the season. The Blue Jays can use that rehab assignment to slowly bring him back and kind of make their own makeshift spring training for him, really. But hearing the word shoulder once is worrying. Hearing it over and over again, that's when it gets scary. Manoa was dealing with a shoulder issue and got that shot last year. We weren't really sure what was going on there. This year, again, the MRI is not showing anything structural. We're not talking about the word tear or anything like that. But, again, it's a shoulder issue. And shoulders, I know we talk about elbows all the time with pitchers. Shoulders can be scary if those start to add up and wear over the years. So, hopefully for Manoa, he can start to ramp up again soon. Uh, But until then, I think you're looking at a starting point that is at least a few weeks into the season. How about this potential serious injury to Jerry Cole, and how would that uh, affect the AL East landscape? That would be huge, and if you are Blake Snell, you're probably uh, looking at your cell phone right now, uh, expecting a big check to come your way. Now, Cole is a guy, I think the last report I saw was that he will get multiple opinions. You don't tend to do that if the first opinion's good. We'll see where this goes with Garrett Cole. He's been so durable for the Yankees for a long time and you cannot replace somebody like him. Yeah. You can go out and blow some money and find a Blake Snell, someone like that. That's still possible. But Garrett Cole is kind of the face of that team right now. Definitely the face of that rotation and was probably the favorite to chase another Cy Young award this year. The Yankees have really built up guys. And I think the Yankees pride is a factor here. (laughs) If Garrett Cole 
is down for a while, then they're not going to roll over. I, I think they will spend and spend and spend, uh, which is refreshing to see. But that's major. He's as important a player as there is in this entire division. Keegan, now that you've been down there a little while, I'd imagine you're starting to get a better sense of what the AL East is going to be like and what the storylines uh, are going to take place. Like, if everything goes well for the Jays, and by that I mean rotation is good like it was last year, they get some more timely hitting, cash in runners in scoring position, the bullpen is pretty good. Like, what does that look like for the Jays in comparison to the rest of the AL East if everything seems to go well? I think it looks a lot like last year. Honestly, I think this division looks a lot like it did a year ago. Now, the Yankees will be a bit better. I don't know if the Orioles will win as many regular season games, but I still think they're an incredible threat. And seeing them yesterday, I mean, I spoke with Jackson Holiday after the game. That kid is going to be a nightmare in the at least for a decade. Like, he is legitimate superstar day one potential. He is going to be one of the best players in this division Day one, Jackson Holiday in Baltimore. So it's not looking any more optimistic for the Blue Jays. It's not doomsday by any means. I think the Red Sox are still the clear number five, but I still think you'd need to make quite an argument to put the Blue Jays any higher than third in this division. And not a great place to be. So if things go right, there's a lot of if, if, if. Yes, it can look different. But the Blue Jays need the pitching, I think, to be as good as it was last year. When we've talked a lot, guys, over the offseason about the offense improving, the bats getting back, all of that's happened with the assumption that their rotation is just going to be great again. That Last year's rotation might be the best rotation I cover for a decade, period. That doesn't happen a lot. And we're just talking about Gosman and Manoa. You're seeing why it doesn't happen a lot. So... There's uh, some ways this can go in the other direction uh, as well, and I think the Blue Jays need need upside. They need to find some upside somewhere. We appreciate you doing this as always, Keegan. Appreciate the time. You got it, guys. Take care. All right, that's Keegan Matheson from MLB.com. Does not sound good on Jerry Cole. Multiple no. MRIs on an elbow a couple weeks out from the beginning of the Major League Baseball season. But again, the Yankees, they could just pivot, right? All right, Blake Snell. You're another yeah. you're another Cy Young guy. You've won in the past, and if Cole's out an extended period of time, in theory, they could just grab him. Now he's obviously not as good as Garrett Cole. The track record is not as solid, but I mean, maybe those are the types of breaks. And you're not cheering for injuries, obviously. That the Blue Jays need if they want to contend in the AL East because Juan Soto's been destroying spring training in his first run with the Yanks here. And I mean, and we know, and we heard Keegan talk about Jackson Holiday, twenty year old kid who is going to be just an absolute electric star in Major League Baseball for many years. They get Corbin Burns as well from Milwaukee to do the Baltimore Orioles. So, you know, the Jays, the splashing, the splashiest moves aren't there, that's for sure. They're, they're elsewhere right. in the division. I, I always find it interesting, though, especially with the Rays and the Orioles. And the Orioles have obviously come on strong last year. But the Jays have this good nucleus of young players, and the Rays seem to do it every single year where yep. those guys kind of, you know, they're there, right, for... However, Jays fans don't want to hear that. The Rays are always there. They're always a good team. But Baltimore, this young group, it's like they seem to have taken this next step. And the Jays young guys, not maybe on an individual level because we still get some really good performances, maybe Vladdy, maybe a, 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 on the lesser side of things, but it feels like they've plateaued in where they are. And Tampa does it every year. And now Baltimore's young guys have, have kind of passed where the Jays young guys are at. I think that's absolutely fair. And I, I don't even know if I would call like guys like Bichette and Vlad Jr. young anymore. Like they're in their mid twenties. They've been around for a long time. These Baltimore guys are all like 20, 21 fresh out of the minors and just torching opposition, including holiday who, if you don't know who he is, he's the number one prospect, Uber prospect, Kind of like the Connor Bedard of baseball in many respects. The son of Matt Holiday, who was an all-star for many years. And apparently this kid is just going to mash right away. Perfect. And he goes into the AL East. Of all 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 divisions Like that needs more star power, the AL East gets it. That's going to be a big-time challenge (laughs) for opposing (laughs) teams all year long. Uh, We'll talk to Chris Rose from the NFL Network about NFL free agency, which officially, unofficially maybe, kicked off this afternoon. Plus... The Overdrive Oscars at 6.30 will be giving away some very special awards in lieu of what happened last night down in Hollywood, where Oppenheimer, seven Academy Awards. Noodles, were you a fan of 
the film? I feel bad. I was telling Cause the other day, I'm so far behind on my movies that I like I bought them on Cineplex.com because I can't. Nowadays, when I go to a movie, it's with my kids. So we're mm-hmm. seeing Kung Fu Panda 4. <laughs> we're not seeing all The Taylor Swift movie, I'm I sure. I did see that. I saw yeah. Taylor Swift, like all of that. So I, I'm behind on the Oscar movies. I am. They are on my list to watch here at this next road trip. I will get to them. So I haven't seen a lot of them. So I'm actually excited. Although I, I, I'm, I, I liked... For example, like the Denzel Washington one, which was the, the number three. I just saw it. The like Equalizer. Said, the Equalizer oh, those three. are great movies. Oh, yeah. Yeah, There's exactly. a three? I didn't oh, know yeah. there was a number Den- three. Third one. Sure yeah, exactly. Oh, sure so, them out. Great. Like, I, I don't get into these like Oscar <laughs> ones. They're too deep for me. You yeah. know, I just, I want the, I want something on the surface where I can see some killing and all of that. Yeah. Stuff. <laughs> Very long Oppenheimer, like more than three hours. I also saw Killers of the Flower Moon, the Scorsese. Movie with De, with De Niro and DiCaprio and Lily Gladstone that was like three and a half hours. Yeah, and those are probably the two best movies of the year. So there I you don't go. know. You got to really carve out a serious chunk of time. If <laughs> no you one's wanted. got that kind. I of mean, time, it is uh, it is quite exactly. challenging. Uh, we have time for something to chew on. We'll get to that. The question of the day on the other side. Again, Chris Rose and the Overdrive Oscars still to come on this Monday afternoon. You're listening and watching to Overdrive. We're back here on Overdrive. Aaron Karolnik in for Brian Hayes with Jamie Noodles McLennan, Frank Corrado. Again, Chris Rose from the NFL Network in about 10 minutes. It's time for Something to Chew On, brought to you by Boston Pizza, Canada's favorite sports bar. From tip-offs to tie bites and puck drops to pizza, BP's elite lineup of apps, wings, and ice-cold beer is always dialed in for game time. Hustle into your local BP tonight. Today's question, gentlemen. If you are the Toronto Maple Leafs, who would you rather face in the first round of the Stanley Cup playoffs? The Boston Bruins or the Florida Panthers? Frank, your answer. <laughs> that doesn't matter, man. Like, what, didn't didn't people chant this last year? We want Boston. That's we want like Florida. five drunk hooligans in front of Scotiabank Arena. That you no. can't paint them with the no, whole. It wasn't five drunk. It was all. There was a ton of them. Don't say there was five drunk. <laughs> can I it just was say the whole crowd? Can I just say I think it's a like it's a it's I don't know it's kind of a dumb question at this point. Like what does it matter? They're gonna have to play Boston, and then if they win, they're gonna have to play Florida. So what the hell does it matter? <laughs> you don't like yeah. the question? No, I don't like the question. You are very dissatisfied with the. I question. I don't like the question. Noodles, well, your thoughts on the question? I'll say Boston. Yeah, um, I'm with you. You are zero and four against them this season. That's the next hurdle to you know jump over. They exercised their demons against Tampa last year. That would be the first one to try and crawl over. Um, the other one is: is there an opportunity? And I this is if they stumble down the stretch here, could you fall into a wild card spot and cross over? That that would be another play the Rangers. One. Like if well, you could yeah. play the Rangers, maybe, or if I don't know if Carolina can even catch them at this point. Right, like something yeah, like that. I guess that. they could. Yeah, ah, take. Yeah, you want to play Carolina would be in, the, in the first round? I yeah. don't know, man. Like actually, you know what? It would. You would still end up because you probably end up in the first wild card spot, so you would end up playing either Florida or Boston again. So really, it's 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 pretty much a collision course. I'm going with Boston. I'm, I'm going to say go at Boston. Like I said, you're 0 and four with against them this season, and they are another kind of storyline that you have to climb. They broke one last year. Let's see if they can break What's one. What's the right year. answer, AK? Yeah, the, Noodles is absolutely correct. It is Boston. And not only have they lost four in a row this year, but they lost three in a row last year. So it's seven games in a row that the Toronto Maple Leafs have lost to the so Boston So are they Bruins. due? Is that like what we're well, saying? They're due to be bought? Because Boston runs their show. So they like, do. are they just due? They're and, just magically going to win four out of seven? <laughs> I'm not saying that, but there are people pointing, Frank, to the early 2000s Toronto Maple Leafs who were just dummied by the Ottawa Senators year in, year out in the regular season. And what happened in the postseason? The exact opposite. Now, I'm sure there are countless examples of the complete opposite thing happening as well with teams who are dominant against another in the regular season. That same season playing in the postseason doesn't necessarily go as well as it did for the Leafs in the early 2000s. But again, it's a pick your poison type situation. Florida is an incredible hockey team. They've been on a ridiculous tear here. I think the last 30 games, they've won 25 of them. Like, I don't want to play Florida. They pick up Tarasenko. He scores two goals in his debut. 
That's just another top How's that six for a line? Barkov, Reinhardt, and Tarasenko. Yeah, How's that, that for a th- like teams, that's a pretty good line? The team's really yeah. nasty. Like they are really, really that's nasty. Boston's thing. great too. That's the other thing. I think Florida's meaner. Like Boston has the you know, the the mantra, the big bad Bruins. Actually, it's the big back Panthers. Yeah. Like the Panthers are hard to play against. The Leafs whereas... just don't play well against Boston, Jamie. It's cra- like yeah. the the risk reward factor when they play the Bruins. I feel like they're you know the game's going well, and then all of a sudden they they make some kind of like unforced error, and it's off the rails, and Boston takes the game over. They just for some I don't know if it's a mental block. They don't play well against Boston. Well, that's why you go right at it. Yeah, you know, go, go right at your your biggest fear. There it is. That's I think I that's say. what they may very well have to do. And I will say, I mean, you look at the playoff picture in the East and the West, there are, is, is so much still up for grabs. And, yeah, the Leafs will almost certainly play either one of Florida or Boston, barring something unforeseen happening, mostly with Toronto. If they were to fall back into a wild card spot, things would have to really go off the rails for the Maple Leafs. They're back in action on Thursday against the Philadelphia Flyers. That was our two of Overdrive. Hour three coming up here on TSN 1050. You've been watching on TSN 4.